Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television here on The Point of View. We pick the right topics, get the right guests. We ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. Tonight, we're looking at Ghana's economy all over again. We're speaking to the former DG of the NDPC. He's presently doing some work with the UN on post-COVID recovery. We'll be asking, what happened to Ghana's economy? Why are we where we are? What can we do to salvage the situation. Is it time for another post uh, century consensus? I'll be telling you more when I come back. Stay with us. Welcome back. So tonight I'm speaking to a man who has many titles. He's an economist, in fact, the first time I, I heard him on radio many, many years ago, he was described as an Africanomist, an African economist. He's also an Nkrumahist. These days, he uh, works with the UN. But he's passionate about Ghana's economy. Dr. Nimoy Thompson is my guest. Welcome to the show. Good Thank evening. you very much. Yeah. How are you doing? Pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Do you live in Ghana or you live abroad? Uh, in and out, but I'll be moving out shortly more for a much longer term. But, but no matter how far away you are, Ghana is still at... Ghana is still, in fact, I've been doing quite a bit of research in local economic development. As mm. I said the last time, for you to understand the national economy, you need to pay attention to the local economy. Mm. And in Ghana, we have 260 local economies. Mm. Wow, 260. We can talk about that later. Yes. I know that before you, you took up this job, previously you were NDPC DG, mm -hmm. which is something I know you were interested in because you always talk about development plan. Right. And I know you like Nkrumah's ideas. Sure. But you also were advisor to Mahama at some point right. as an economist right. in, his, in his office. If you look at where the government is with all the challenges with e-levy, parliament, go to IMF, debt situation, are you kind of relieved that you are not in government? <laughs> no, I'm not, actually. I wish I could contribute to some of the solutions because currently mm. I'm actually contributing to to solutions outside. Really? Because you mentioned the UN. I wrote the conceptual framework for resilient uh, economic recovery from uh, COVID, which is being used in 16 different countries now. Really? On a pilot basis, yes. Through the UN's five economic uh, uh, development commissions. Maybe before the show ends, I'll ask you on some general ideas for post-COVID recovery. No problem. Since you are doing it for 18 countries. 16. 16 countries. Right. Uh, all African? No, no, no. Three in Africa. The really? rest in Latin America. So it's like America. a global plan. It's a global. It's a global. Working thing. with a team in the UN. The UN, yeah. It's the you know the, the UN has five uh, uh, regional economic commissions mm -hmm. like uh, ECA and so forth. Mm -hmm. So they have them around the world. They have it in Latin America, wow. Europe, uh, uh, Asia, and so forth. In fact, the U UN Economic Commission for Europe and then the UN Capital Development Fund that actually asked mm -hmm. me to. Some people write. say that it's people uh, economists. Uh, politicians, lawyers, and all these people who work in government always sound very clear when they are not in government. But when they are in government, they don't sound very articulate because things are different. I've had, not particularly you, but I've had a few people compare some other political people when they were in government. Mm -hmm. When they speak, they don't understand. Well, now that they speak about the economy, it's very easy to understand. Mm -hmm. Is it that when you are not in office, it's easier to talk? Or is it mm -hmm. that you see the economy from a different perspective, or when you are in office, you, it's not everything you can say, mm -hmm. or that people are judging you based on not just what you say about your result, and therefore you don't sound as cogent? What, well, what there's always the benefit of hindsight and, yeah. of course, experience. But yeah. to avoid or to at least minimize that, that's why mm. we prepared the 40-year development plan. Mm. Unfortunately, people hear 40 and they think it's into the future, so we'll have nothing to do with it. But we've already lost, uh, we, at least we've lost four, uh, four years, 2018 mm -hmm. to last year, four years. So we're actually down to 36. Mm. Uh, and a lot of the recommendations in that plan, that's why I'm so passionate about post-COVID development economics. Okay. Because a lot of the recommendations we made in the 40-year development plan are precisely those that are coming up in all the discussions about post COVID development economics. So mm. the role of the informal sector now is major on all the platforms that are participate in. How do we transform the informal economy? Because it cannot remain like that. Mm. Unfortunately for us in Ghana, we're actually moving in the opposite direction. We have no strategy. The 40-year the plan actually did say that we should have a strategy in place for the transformation or the informal. We have no, we think going, taxing them would transform them. No, it, it wouldn't work at all. Mm. Because the, the bulk of them are actually in the poverty, in the uh, poor 
uh, uh, bracket, the poverty bracket, where they don't have to pay. Something like 74% mm. of them are in what we call vulnerable employment. So mm. even if you register all of them, you still wouldn't get that much in taxation. Mm. The proper approach is to have a, a, a program for the transformation of the informal economy by one, improving efficiency, mm -hmm. two, raising productivity, three, raising incomes therefore, and therefore you have a much higher base. And this is where also the distinction between tax net and tax base comes in. I've been following the discussion and we keep confusing the two. Expand the tax net. No, it doesn't work like that. The tax, you can expand the tax net all you want, but all you may get is like Kita school boys, a lot of small fishes without the big ones. But the focus strategically should be on the tax base, the source of the income. I see. So if you focus and grow that, yes, you would expand the uh, tax net all right, but you will get even more money. So the bigger the base, exactly. the more the net catches. In fact, the, the higher the yield. The, the bigger the base, the higher yield. So you it's tax base, not tax net. Not, you can tax listen. Base. I, the example I give is that you can register all the kayas in Ghana mm. and tax them for the next 20 years. Mm. You still won't get a fraction of what you get from just plugging holes at, at Tema. I see. Or seeing that these multinationals do not indulge in all sorts of practices that lead to... So uh, when you look at where we are in the economy, is it misfortune of COVID that has brought us here? Or is it mismanagement? It's more mismanagement than uh, misfortune. Uh, as I said, uh, the, with the documents I sent you, mm. on the eve of COVID 2019, mm -hmm. the government itself, not, mm. not Moody's or Fisher, the government itself had... Uh, downgraded its own economic outlook. Really? Remember, yeah, remember the, yeah. the, the thing I said? Yes, I've you. seen the first one. Is right. there. When government downgraded Ghana's economic outlook 2019. Exactly. So they, they have lost it in their, let me see if I can quote from their manifesto. Mm -hmm. The manifesto says, our goal mm -hmm. inter earlier is to achieve double digit DGP, GDP growth annually for the next four years. Uh -huh. And then in parentheses, they say, under the Kufo led MPP government, the economy attained a GDP growth rate of 9.1% in 2008 without oil. Mm -hmm. We will reduce the cost of doing business, maintain fiscal discipline, reduce government borrowing, and reduce interest rates to spur private sector investment. Okay. So they pledged double-digit growth, which is, if, if we're so to attain... Ten. Yeah, so the, the, the orange line is what they were hoping the to The minimum they, pl they pledged. The first year they did 8.1. 2017. Yes, that was because of some statistical fluke. But even that you grant that, because the oil sector grew by 80, 80 percent, that's because the previous year it had shrank by 15 percent. So whenever you move from negative to... The growth positive, is very high. Exactly. But even if you grant, thereafter just declined uh, to 6.3 and then went up to 7. Uh, point zero. But don't forget, in 2020, they were actually uh, projecting a, a slowdown or decline in growth rate to 6.8. And then it was going to go all the way down to 4.6 in 2022 this year and then pick up to... So this was their projection. This was their own downward uh, uh, outlook. outlook of the economy at the time. And this was in 2019. 2019. So not even they had the, the rosiest So let me just say, this, this is not real. This is actually the 2019 outlook the government put out. Exactly. And your argument is that based on this outlook, they were expecting things to get tight prior to 2020 COVID. That's what you're saying. They were already doing that. And in many respects, I mm -hmm. think the other... Uh, the other chart that shows the exactly. sectoral growth. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because the economy actually started going into... So first of all, started then went into negative territory in certain key mm -hmm. sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, the boxes you see, so the one on the left is mining. Mm -hmm. it, so these it, are the subsectors of the industry sector, exactly. mining, manufacturing, the, the, We have water. three sectors. Yes. We have industry, we have agriculture, we have services. Mm -hmm. Services were so decimated by the uh, financial sector reforms, I don't even put it there, but you see negative, negative, negative. But the key one here, this is the body blow mm -hmm. that the government itself dealt the economy from the beginning from 2017 onwards. And you've done that, it quarterly? Yeah, is that this is from the Ghana Statistical Service. Okay, actually. so this is not your data. This no, is no, GSS this, this data. is GSS data. Okay. It's all, when you go on their website, it's there. I just put the boxes there to highlight when they peaked. So you see mining peaked in the second quarter of 2017. Okay. And there, after it started slowing, it picked up slightly in 24th quarter, but it slowed up until, uh, from 32. All the way to negative. 12. 
No, no. Before, 12 in 2019 Q4. Uh, yeah, Q4. This was the eve of COVID. Okay. So mining was already declining. It had nothing to do with COVID. What about manufacturing? Manufacturing was, uh, peaked at the third quarter of 2017. 13%. Uh, 13. And then it kept slowing. It picked up somewhat. But by the eve of COVID, it was down to 6.3 from right. 13. All right. This was before COVID. And then uh, electricity also peaked uh, 19. That's the fourth quarter of 2017. And then it kept coming down to 6% on the eve of COVID. The most damaging ones are water supply and construction. Construction in particular, because they, the, the, of course, water is there. It peaked at 8.2. By the eve of COVID, it was 4.4. And that's quarterly. And because the quarterly growth rates are annualized, the fourth quarter growth rate is also the same as the annual. So the 4.4 you see there means that for 2019, the water production, uh, water and sewage production actually declined by 4.4. But the one, perhaps the- The most the, serious will be construction. Uh, exactly. Because it, it reflects the early policies of the government when they came in and put a freeze, a blanket freeze on construction spending. Your argument is that the problems we are facing mm -hmm. predated COVID and they are self-inflicted by mismanagement. With mismanagement. And this is just domestic. I have other figures here that show a decline in foreign direct investment in 2019 and 2020, while it was growing in other countries like Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo. They all have positive... So FDI was declining prior to COVID. Uh, 2019, I can, this is from the World Investment Report. It says FDI to Ghana dropped by 50, uh, by 22% to approximately 2.3 billion in 2019. I'll be happy to have that. No e problem evidence. at all. I'll share. And then Senegal, FDI to Senegal increased. Mm. FDI to Ghana decreased by 20, This is 2019. And FDI to Senegal increased by 16%. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on Cote d'Ivoire increased by 63%. Same period. We are in the same period, same region. And then for 2020, we have Ghana registered a 52% decline in, F, uh, uh, in FDI in 2020, leaving inflows to 1.1. And then elsewhere in the document, it talks about increases in Nigeria, Senegal, the same Senegal also. Senegal was among the few economies on the continent who have received mm. higher inflows in 2020, with a 39% increase to 1.5 billion. So we have a fundamental problem of mismanagement, lack of... Uh, Internal consistency in policy. But you've not given enough evidence of mismanagement. You've said that there was a um, sort of a freeze on construction, mm -hmm. and you've shown that it affected the growth rate, and you've explained what construction is. I understand that. Mm -hmm. Now, you've told me that FDI in Ghana prior to COVID was reducing, mm -hmm. and when you compare that to comparator countries, it was low. But I don't think that's enough evidence of mismanagement. Good. Um, then we'll go to the article I sent you, mm -hmm. the budget the Bible and Bob Marley, which I wrote in 2018. The budget, the Bible, I remember that. Yes, and Bob, and Bob Marley. Marley. Yes. <laughs> and I made the case. <laughs> what do the budget, the Bible and Bob Marley have in common? <laughs> this is serious. <laughs> because it had to do with, the, if, you're, you know, if you're a small ax and you dig a hole and so forth and so on. The very first uh, paragraph answers mm -hmm. your question. Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing, I call it manifesto delirium. Mm -hmm. You come to power and you're so delirious. We want, we are going to do, imp implement our manifesto without first subjecting the manifesto to objective analysis, looking at the conditions in which you are going to operate, mm. sequencing, timing, they are all critical. But when you come into office and you begin to, imp in this particular case, this is where they made the, 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 the strategic blunders. Mm -hmm. Don't forget the economy went into a slowdown in 2015, mm -hmm. 2.2. And then by 2016, as a result of Sinchi and other policies, it was picking up from the various policies stimulating growth that were, that were put in place. What the government should have done when it came into office was to build on that, to grow the economy. Rather, they took their eyes of growth-inducing policies and rather focused on consumption-driven policies. So what happens? There's, uh, uh, there was free SHS, which was being implemented without any due regard to financial implications for the program itself and other sectors of education. Because education is more than just SHS. You have JHS, primary, uh, kindergarten, and then above that. They were so obsessed with uh, creating new regions. These all put 
a strain on the government's budget. And when the economy is not growing, you are going to have more or less the perfect storm. So I remember they said they were moving the economy from taxation to production. That was 2017. Well, it was in the manifesto and it was yeah, part and of the campaign. And then they said there were nuisance taxes that they were reducing. They reduced, they removed them in 2017. But yes. in 2018, they realized that they had made a mistake and tried to sneak them back in. So, so let's take one more. You said construction came down, FDI came down, manufacturing slowed, manufacturing slowed created more regions, mm -hmm. free SHS and then more districts. Mm -hmm. 44 new districts. And all of these are consumption and not investment. And education is an investment. I know you believe no, in education. education from, it's a human capital investment. Yeah. But we are talking about growth, economic growth, to support education in the first place. Mm -hmm. So free SHS, for instance, brilliant idea. Yeah. But did we have to implement it when we did? No. It should have taken... Should have waited? Of, of course, for us to... Not, not like much later, it could have been done in the third year or the fourth year mm. when we have stabilized the economy and we were sure about sources of sustainable financing but mm. it looks like the politics of it got the better of them that we promised it and we're going to so we traded the growth that we needed to support these social programs and you just cannot do mm. that and now in in the 2022 uh, budget i see that they they're actually boasting that they put 300,000 people on the government payroll i don't quite understand whether they are temporary people, whether they're even counting the NAPCO people, because it's a very serious thing. The, if my memory serves me right, the pre previously, the, the, the government payroll was just over 500,000. And if you added 300,000 more, that's a serious strain there. Unfortunately for us, in the document, in the budget, they said they added the 300,000 to increase productivity. That itself is completely wrong. So how do we measure? So your point is that just employing new people, creating more districts, sub-metros does not necessarily become productive. Is there a measure? So how do you know? It actually, in theory, mm. you actually undermine productivity. Really? Because, of course, because for one thing, um, all you are doing is basically paying salaries. As I said in the article, the, the wage bill went up, but then the allocations for goods and services declined. Allocations for capital spending also mm. went down. So you, the people are sitting there. But you could argue that if you have a sub-metro and they have more, they have, so let's assume you had AMA, Accra is large. If you break it into four sub-metros, revenue officers have a more granular area to target to collect revenue. So mm. potentially, mm -hmm. you could have better coverage and mm. better management, mm -hmm. potentially. Mm -hmm. So it's a smaller group of, smaller area to manage. Some mm -hmm. could argue that. Yeah, but you could still If do it's that. done well, the revenue generation potential of the submetros could be more. Except that, again, in, in practice, that's not what they did. Okay. They just, just as they do other things, they just went and just did things. So, for example, as I said, now AMA is made up of just three submetros. Mm -hmm. uh, Gamashi, uh, no, um, I think Okai. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, Ashedu Keteke, mm -hmm. Okankwe South, and I think um South. Yes. Uh, yeah, these three. Yes. Now, here's the thing. The AMA is here. But their office is over there. They actually have to travel across other new districts to get to their office somewhere else. Clearly, someone did this thing without thinking. It's like you with your studio here. You have your office here. But in order for you to go on air, you have to travel to Joy FM to go in there. <laughs> this, is, this is what they've done. In some districts, typically most districts depend on markets and lorry parks. So if you go in there, you slash it, and the markets and lorry parks are in one old district and the new district has nothing, you are simply setting them back. And there's a lot of that going on that went on mm. in the 44 new districts. And as I said, local economic development, th that's what my research was all about, looking at the drivers of it, what is happening. The level of interference at the local level, at the national level, the level of deprivation, mm. the level of confusion. So in one of my recommendations, I have a list of recommendations I can send to you mm. later on, was that we should have change management in decentralization. We'll look at recommendations okay. and also potential homegrown solutions when we come back. This is mm -hmm. the point of view. Dr. Nimoy Thompson says that where we are is not because of misfortune, it's mismanagement. He actually says, he predicted it. If you read his article in 2018, the Bible, the budget, and Bob Marley, he sort of insinuates certain things were going to happen, which turned out to be so. Now, so what is the solution? Is E-Levy the solution? Does he have, he has a solution for 16 countries in the world. Can he be a prophet in his own home? <laughs> we'll also talk about one of his great idols, Kwame Nkrumah, we all love him. Uh, 24th, which is tomorrow, would be the 
I don't know which anniversary of his overthrow, but a lot mm -hmm. of people say that the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah became the, the, the dark days in Ghana. Mm -hmm. We'll spend some time talking about that to stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight we're talking economy. If you've been following this show for a few weeks, you would know that the economy is in dire straits. So apart from the downgrades from the global cre credit agencies, um, if you read reports even from the World Bank about where Ghana's economy is, we're in big, big trouble. We owe a lot of money. Uh, our deficit is very high. The first two line items on our budget takes all our revenue. So by the time you pay salaries and you pay interest, everything is gone. Yeah. The E-Levy has been touted as one of the key solutions to this. Before I come to your proposed solution, um, what do you think of the E-Levy? Um, I think it's an ill-conceived, ill-advised uh, tax. It's in, in, in American football, you know how the, the truth, they have something to call Hill Mary uh, Pass, <laughs> where they threw it at the last moment out of desperation. <laughs> And this, this, this I talk about basketball, American football. No, American football. That's a Hail Mary. You can Google that. Okay. It's last a minute. Last minute. It's a last gasp measure. This mm. is after they have squandered. And I'll go through the numbers. It's simply mind-boggling. The amount of money we've had before COVID and during COVID. Listen, the IMF gave us two billion US dollars. One billion in 2020, another billion in 2021. The IMF usually doesn't give you money without any conditionalities. In 2015, when we went to the IMF, they pledged, they didn't give us, they pledged 940 million to be released over three years, subject to certain conditionalities. This wasn't the case in 2020 wow. and 2021. They gave us, because of the pandemic, they're like, go and spend. That's why, as I said earlier, they are now lurking in the shadows, waiting for us to go to them. And the number of conditionalities that they're likely to put on the table, that's probably why our government is reluctant to go. They are reluctant. You don't to think it's because of the politics of saying they criticize you guys for being. I think that might account program. for ten percent of it. Really, foolish pride. We all do have moments of foolish pride. You think pride. they have more serious reservations than because that? Because if they were to go to the IMF, the IMF is going to insist on auditing COVID uh, expenditures. Really? Oh yes, because they won't come and give you money without looking at what you did wrong, and they know that it's happening. Have you seen the video for Malawi? the president of Malawi, where he actually listed the ministers who have been prosecuted for COVID expenditure fraud, including a member of his cabinet who refunded 600,000 kwacha. And the president said, thank you, but no, because at the time you were chopping that money, it wasn't available for someone who needed it. So he fired him. In the US, if you go online now, every week they are sending people to jail. For still, Some people took the COVID money and bought Lamborghinis. Some bought a million dollar homes. In the U.S.? Oh, yes. But the federal government said, no matter where you are. So you think if the IMF, if we were to go for an IMF program, they would insist on They would on demand an, that. But why do you think the government would be against that? Of course. But, but was it yesterday that the, the minority made a, uh, uh, a, a, a request? A private member's motion. Exactly. And not only that. Don't forget, last year also, uh, Harun Edrisu made that proposal. The... Uh, Auditor General at the time showed interest, and within days, they, he was declared a Togolese and tossed out. <laughs> no, what so I... the, 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 the point is that, the point, and someone used the term that uh, the, the COVID pandemic also created a corruption pandemic. Not just in Ghana, by the way. It happened globally. The difference uh, is how, you can Google it, COVID and, uh, COVID COVID. and corruption. It's all over. So they people saw the COVID as a chance to enrich themselves. That's and what you're saying. Now and Ghana, you believe this to be true for Ghana? Oh, for, for sure. For sure. I mean, you see that we only have up, up to 2020, 2021. And you see that some of the beneficiaries... But how much did we actually get? You said we got $2 billion from the IMF. $1 billion first, $2 billion, uh, Then uh, the World Bank gave like half a billion. Mm -hmm. uh, the donors, a lot of the interventions you saw were actually financed by uh, the, the, the UN, various UN agencies, mm. such as digging uh, boreholes or having these electronic things. A lot, quite a lot of it. And of course, Ghanaians 
also did contribute. The bottom line is that until there's an audit, we will know the magnitude. We do know from anecdotal evidence mm -hmm. that those who are rich became a lot richer from COVID procurement. Really? So you feel the government is not going to be happy with an audit of COVID expenses? Of course. They will not be. Which, is, which, in your view, is the number one thing the IMF would demand? The IMF, uh, that's, that's what we are picking up on in the charter rooms. That's, they, they will insist. And not just an audit by the Auditor General. They may actually insist that it be an outside auditing uh, company. You, th you think so? Because, because of the way we treated the previous Auditor General. The second thing they're likely to put on the table mm -hmm. is the role of the Minister of Finance's company in racking up the public debt, which is through Data Bank, and the other minister's company, which is the uh, Black Star uh, Advisors. They all participate. Now, it why creates, would they be interested in that? Okay, there's a, because it, again, they want to know why you got into the mess in the first place so they can help you. One thing is the uh, issue of conflict of interest. In mm -hmm. this case, it's, it's, it's even worse than conflict. It's more like an incestuous relationship, mm -hmm. where on the one hand, the ministers have the mandate and responsibility to minimize our public debt. Mm -hmm. But on the other side of the fence, they are involved in activities to maximize the public debt so that they profit as much as possible from it. You're basically suggesting that the reason we, our debt is so high is that the finance minister and the minister of state their companies will benefit I'm saying from that, how did they benefit from the fact that when we take a, a, a facility from any of these bond markets, they would get if if I were in that position, if I were the, and any rational person were in that position, mm. and your business is in business to make profit, it's always in your interest to see the government borrow more. And if you are the same person making the decision to borrow, of course you're going to so make. That, but that's you, a very, but some would say that's a very cynical view you are taking. It's that. not a cynical view. You don't view. think that the, the finance minister and his uh, deputies put the country's interests ahead of. Then let let the record speak for itself. Mm. Have you read any of the things they say justifying the debt? One, they use the debt they take to refinance uh, uh, existing debt, and then the rest is what they, they say for budget support. That is the smoking gun. Mm. But just what is what the hell is budget support? It could be anything. But mm. then maybe the laws are weak. Strictly, if we had the laws, mm. you borrow only for infrastructure. And even then, you should list the infrastructure, do the proper appraisal, so that any Ghanaian can go to the website and see that okay, we wow. borrowed five billion, we used two billion to restructure debt, three billion is going into uh, infrastructure, the, the building roads. None of these. Instead, all you hear, and when you go through the budget, you see he says things like for budget support, but it's a nebulous term that mm. could mean anything. It could mean that you put the money in the budget and the president uses it for his... So if you, if, I mean, I, I, if you follow this borrowing thing, I think the first person who went to the bond market was... Uh, president Kufour. And uh, Banredu. Mm -hmm. Then I think under Tekwe went a couple, three times or so. Yes. Particularly this... Uh, Four. Yeah. So, I, and again, the issue of what they use the money for, I remember interviewing Mr. Tekwe where he talks about reprofiling our debt. So yes. it takes... Yes, from low, uh, debt, uh, yes, which in essence is what this minister also says. Mm -hmm. So, what what part, is wrong with their debt strategy? Only, only I, want, part, I want to understand: is it the quantum of debt that you have a problem with, the, or the reason for going for the loans, you use or the, the word, places they go for money from? Uh, you use the word cynical. So let me quote from the budget from the from the minister's own words. Yeah, 2019. Yeah, talking about cynicism. 2019 budget, paragraph 24. Mm -hmm. There's a section that I'll skip and go directly to the heart of it. He says. We are fully aware of what happened in the last time Ghana's economy was rebased. Don't forget, in 2018, the economy was rebased. And so this is what he was talking about. We are fully aware of what happened the last time Ghana's economy was rebased in November 2010, mm -hmm. resulting in a 63% upward change. It gave the then managers of the economy a false sense of security mm -hmm. as the debt-to-GDP ratio was significantly reduced. They went on a borrowing spree forgetting that rebasing also exposed how very little revenue we raised through taxation. Wow, this is Ken Oferiata. This is Ken Oferiata speaking What year now. is this? This is 2019 budget paragraph 24. So this is when we are exiting the original IMF program. Exactly. Now, li listen to what he's saying here. He doesn't even mention them. He just, th this is what I can't call Cassandra or mm -hmm. Inwendo. Mm -hmm. He says, the then managers of the economy went on a borrowing spree. Now, let's look at what really happened mm -hmm. before then. Mm -hmm. The, the rebasing was done in 2010. Mm -hmm. In 2012, mm -hmm. this was, well, we are not going to mention any names, just the then managers <laughs> of the economy. 2012, we borrowed 1 billion. Mm -hmm. 
2014, 1 billion, mm -hmm. 2015, 1 billion, mm -hmm. and 2016, 750 million. Mm. All right? Mm -hmm. So in three years, 2012, 2014, 2015, we borrowed 3 billion in three years. Mm -hmm. Now, we, you come to this minister who cynically telling us that the others went on the borrowing spree without thinking. Mm -hmm. In 2018, it was 2 billion. 2019, 3 billion. 2020, 3 billion. 2021, 3 billion plus wow. change. Wow. So in just one year, That's they borrowed ele three... 11 billion. Yes, but for the three years, it's 9 billion. Then yeah. you add the other two that yeah. preceded. But I'm interested in the fact that in one year, they borrowed 3 billion compared to the then managers of the economy who borrowed 3 billion is this in dollar? three this is years. Dollars? Oh, yeah, yeah, all the euro bonds are in dollars. Yes, I, so that comparison is so this is all yes, dollars. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. But then if you put it all together, if you look at euro bonds since President Kufu mm -hmm. till now, it's about 15.5 billion. Mm -hmm. 70 point, or let's say 71% of it has been accumulated under this government. Wow. So money coming from the years and all, it's all over the place. And then the question is what happened? And so when you use such a general and nebulous term like for budget support, in some other jurisdictions, they actually have laws against that. When you borrow, you must show what you're going to use it for and it must go into capital. Oh. Because in this case, when it's budget support, it could go to the government machinery where the president gets to rent his planes and all that. You could have a situation where they even use the money to send party people to go and hunt down Trinity Jonas in New York. It's part of that money. Meanwhile, your roads are bad. And I actually have a friend. He, he lives in uh, New Jersey. He was running a business here. When he saw that very thing, he left Ghana. He actually decided to sell his business at a loss and leave Ghana because he was so frustrated. At the time, he had actually shown me the receipt that he received from the city he lives wow. in, in, in New Jersey, mm. where he had paid his local uh, taxes, and the same receipt that explains what they had used the money for. So your point is that if we use the words of the Minister of Finance in 2019 mm -hmm. against him, mm -hmm. then his performance is worse than his predecessor. That's what you're suggesting. I'm not even going to, well, he did his predecessor, but my interest is more the gap between the promise and the performance. Mm. the promise and the potential. I'm not going to go back. There's a time for comparing. Because again, when you look, I have other no, figures. No, just because you quoted 2019 and yes. said, because of the rebasing, mm -hmm. the previous It creates admin, a false illusion yes. that, yeah. But you're, 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 you've shown that the, the amount they borrowed was much, much more than what the in predecessors one year, borrowed. In just one year, they borrowed more than the entire period for the predecessors that he was ridiculing. And then when you go on further and analyze the budget, you see the huge gaps in capital expenditure over that period. So again, we are left asking questions. We don't have all the answers, for sure. But, then but if, you, if you can think of, of the bat, you could say free SHS, one, uh, I don't know whether it is one village, one dam, and some of those things mm -hmm. that the, the Ministry of Special Development did. If you look mm -hmm. at the size of that ministry's budget, it was much larger than even regular ministries. So you could guess that It's not the size. I told you about the new, uh, the post-COVID development economics, mm. one of the key uh, principles is mm. efficiency. Mm. So it's not so much the size. That's why when they make the claim that we hired 300,000 people and that will increase productivity, it mm. means they have a very distorted view of productivity. It doesn't lead to productivity. If anything, it undermines productivity. Mm. And when productivity goes down, obviously your revenue yield is going to flow. In fact, one of the uh, uh, strategic errors they made, blunders they made, was to destroy high-paying jobs, for instance, in the uh, finance, financial sector and other sectors, and then go ahead and put party foot soldiers in the security services. Where, how much do they get paid? 1,200 CDs a month compared to an average of about you, seven. You are, you are calling <clears throat> the rationalization of the financial sector the destruction of jobs? Of course, to the extent that it led to the closure of banks and, of course, the destruction of jobs. They could have taken a much more uh, surgical approach, I would think, I believe it's not that we didn't need reforms there, mm. but it could have been more surgical and more sustainable and more strategic. I think uh, GN Bank, for instance, had outgrown Indum himself, that he had become more or less a national asset of sorts. He had more branches than even Ghana Commercial Bank. Mm. So he was serving a particular purpose. Do you know how much money he was paying the telcos just to wire his banks around the country alone? All these things were destroyed without thinking of the implications, and we ended up creating low-paying jobs. Mm. Did you see the article of the Mpoho MP where he showed pictures of five young men that he put in the police service? 
this is this this is our concept of job creation. Wow. Where you put young men in security service. Meanwhile, when we prepared the long-term national development plan, and I did the briefing, we said that listen, based on a demographic change between now and 2057, we will have to create 15 million new jobs, mm. which comes up to 375,000 jobs a year. Now we already have 310,000 people entering the labor force. So on average, we're already doing well. Mm. But in 2016, we also had the first ever Ghana labor force survey. Believe it or not, all this while, we have never had a labor force survey in Ghana. The only ones we had were taken from the Ghana Living Standards Survey. But this one was the most comprehensive. And I encourage you to download it, read it, share it with your viewers and listen. It's a fantastic document. I'll take a break. When I come yes. back, I will ask you, succinctly what some of your solutions are okay and then we'll talk about Kwame Nkrumah as well this is the point of view my guest Dr. Nimoy Thompson really no holds bad he basically thinks that managers of the economy mismanage the economy self-inflicted challenges and he describes the e-levy as a Hail Mary <laughs> Charlie Hail Mary will basically <laughs> Charlie I don't know he says they throw some ball and the ball they <laughs> no doc you're a big man when we come back we'll try and understand more of that stay with us Welcome back. This is still the point of view. My guest is economist Dr. Nimoy Thompson, who is really not happy with the way the economy is going. His current work is to help draft post-COVID recovery plans for different countries under the UN. So, Doc, give me two or three things you, you feel we should do as a country. The first because we are in trouble. You are, we, are, we, are we are in, in trouble. trouble. Yes. We are in trouble. And the first thing, again, is to ask them to be humble enough mm. to embrace the long-term national development plan, the 40-year development plan. Okay. Now, people always think, well, 40 years is into the future and so forth and so on. But as I said, mm. it starts with the first year. Mm -hmm. The United States, for example, has a 100-year plan for creating jobs, mm. 1950 to 2050. Wow. So that's why you have a Ghanaian who finishes university here, stays at home for three, four years, they can't find a job. They get off the plane at JFK. Within two weeks, they are working. That's because there are more jobs in the U.S. than there are the number of uh, employed people. And before, because of this policy, 100-year plan for creating jobs, the American economy is just there to do nothing but create jobs. So if you've been following the news, Biden has just set a record. He created 6.6 .6 million new jobs in his first term. That has never been done before. The record was held by Jimmy Carter and all that. So jobs, jobs, jobs. But they cannot do that without understanding the structural causes of our problems. Bernard, our economy is a post-colonial economy. It was never meant to be developed. So we need to understand that. That's why Nkrumah started with the, we usually say the seven-year development plan. But the full name of that plan is seven-year plan for reconstruction and development, to mm. decolonize mm. the economy mm. before you can even even begin to develop it. But we haven't done that. Mm. And we keep trying to impose all these new liberal uh, uh, textbooks. It wouldn't take us, you know, you look at monetary policy, for example, in Ghana, yeah. which is uh, inflation targeting and all that. For the next 200 years, it wouldn't take us anywhere, as long as we stick with that. It, wouldn't take, us, years. it wouldn't take us anywhere, because it's not meant for a post-colonial economy. The idea of stable prices. You know, stable prices by and themselves, mean not, it means nothing. Mm. There are countries with lower inflation than we do, yeah. and we are doing better than they are. Yeah. Yes, there are several. I've compared Ghana to Kenya and South Africa. We have a much higher interest rate than they do, and therefore we should have a lower inflation, right? Yeah. But they have lower inflation than we do, because we are not thinking, we are not viewing this as a colonial economy that wasn't meant to be developed. It needs to be uncolonized. First, De decolonize. Decolonize. That. decolonize. Thank you very much. Decolonize. Because you see those doing um, um, inflation targeting. Yeah. One of their biggest concerns is that the unemployment rate is too low. Yeah. They actually worry that at some point the unemployment rate is too low. So let's raise interest rates to slow down the economy. Because they are doing Phillips curve. Exactly. But that's exactly. Yeah. But that's their thing. I suppose so you're saying those things don't apply? No. The inverse relationship uh, between... Uh, Bernard, the, because we learned it in school. Though. We did. I know you studied economics. Kev. Our problem is that <laughs> our inflation rate is what? Too high. <laughs> you see? 
They are worried that uh, unemployment rate will be too low. Ours is that the unemployment rate is too high. Mm. And even where people are employed, we have a term called vulnerable employment mm. or vulnerable employment rate, yeah, yeah. which in Ghana is 74%. So even though in theory they are employed, in reality they are barely surviving. So how do you decolonize the economy? The, to, first of all is to start with, we have a number of levels. The macroeconomic uh, policies need to change. Mm. So in the case of monetary policy, uh, for mm. example, we need to amend the Bank of Ghana law mm. to change. Oh, yes, we have to. We need to be radical. I was happy what they did during the uh, uh, pandemic because it went beyond the traditional tools and used quantitative measures. It was fantastic. And I thought they were actually going to institutionalize that, only for me to read that they were going to wind it down and go back to the status quo ante. It's not going to take us anywhere. So having felt that, we now need to come in and amend the law and make economic growth and job creation the primary objective of monetary policy in Ghana. And then price stability will become secondary objective. So the monetary authority's focus should be economic growth and, and employment rate. Not stable prices. Stable prices and then what? Because for us, the, 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 the main source of uh, inflation in Ghana is structural. It's not monetary. Only the monetary part is very small. It's, co it's, it's, it's cost push. Cost push. So what's the uh, average uh, speed of a cargo truck in Ghana? It's 18 miles per hour compared to 55 that is recommended. That alone mm. is an indication. The way, so, and I, I, I'm, I don't mm. want to jump the gun because in post-COVID uh, economics I'm talking about, we do discuss different types of efficiencies. Mm. So your technical efficiency, are your employees working the way they should? I so see. you go to DVLA, for example, the first thing you're likely to see is someone sitting there at the reception with headphones on doing uh, social media. They don't even care that you are there. <laughs> Charlie, I'm, sure, I'm not sure DVLA will be happy to hear No, this. no, no. I've been there. They, and they, I've are, seen, they are modernizing. They are, they are modernizing. They are to, there are aspects of their uh, services that are good. So they colonize the economy. We, we need to think, think, change the Bank of Ghana's focus from just price stability to job creation. And that's one. Growth. That's and one. Else? But once you've done that, you also need to then create uh, uh, labor economics department at the bank to help oh, really? support that. Oh, yes. So the central bank governor's job is job... It's thinking about jobs. Uh, uh, creating the conditions for creating jobs. Mm. The actual business of creating jobs is the government of the day. Mm. That will come from what? Sectoral reforms. I get you. So but they will use their monetary tools to enhance precisely. credit to the private so sector. It, and they will do like what this. we call realist monetary policy. You look at the real sector. Okay. What is going on with growth? What is going on with employment? If unemployment is too high, you then begin to put in place the necessary measures to stimulate growth. Okay. But they cannot do it alone, though. Mm. They must do that in conjunction with the government. That's why I said they need the 40-year national development plan. When we brief them, don't forget I was in office till the end of 2017. I made it clear to them that, listen, I understand 1D1F. It's a brilliant idea. In fact, when I was in office, we were receiving queries from South Africa and other places that, hey, we've heard about 1D1F. We want to learn from it. So it's a brilliant idea. But bear in mind that 80% of all new jobs are created by existing businesses. Mm. And therefore, the job creating strategy should focus on removing bottlenecks to production and distribution. In existing companies. In existing companies. Because one, they've been around for a while, they made all the mistakes that, should be, that could be made as opposed to 1D1F. They are now coming to make mistakes and find new markets. Mm. We already have those who have mm. the markets. Mm. And they are facing challenges sometimes. And there's something we call economic infrastructure. That is electricity water, transportation, uh, communication, these four. Mm. You need to deal, until we deal with them in, in conjunction with others also, we're not going anywhere. Mm. So if you look at the plan, we had recommendations for all of that. So if you look at electricity, they were losing 24% of distributed electricity. We gave them targets, reduce them. And but to be fair, the government this week announced areas of cut. They said we're going to cut the spending by 20%. They mentioned some savings in renegotiating the IPPs. They mentioned some rationalization in the public sector in terms of salaries. Mm -hmm. I recall there were two other things that they mentioned. Terrific. To cut the expenditure by where, 20%. That's where they the should last, have started last, last from. Week. That's where they should have started. All over the world, whenever a government runs into financial problems, the very first thing it does is to cut expenditure, not to raise revenue. Because you have more direct control over expenditure. You can do that like this. Revenue, look at how they're suffering with e-levy. But if they have started with revenue, and I think I saw your commentary, 
about the, the wastage in the system. Listen, a minister goes to a program that lasts for three hours, and his V8 is sitting there with the air conditioning running for three hours. Have yeah. we lost our damn minds? Yeah, that's... that's... I mean, how? He's too good all of a sudden to wait for five minutes to, for, for the vehicle to cool. So for three hours, mm. the vehicle is sitting there. And then you come, oh, honorable, honorable. That so the cut is... is, is the, it needs to be... And personally, I would actually like to see, because the project I'm going to work on deals with some of these things. Well, I would like to see committees in parliament and the ministries set up on the importance of efficiency. Let's I, end with Kwame Nkrumah. So mm -hmm. if you're watching this program on a Wednesday... That's the day before it's overthrow. So Thursday is 24th. Haven't we made too much noise about this? I know Socialist Forum is doing something mm -hmm. on Thursday mm -hmm. on Kwame Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. It's like, you guys are always talking about Kwame Nkrumah. It's like, Nkrumah it's, never dies. Nkrumah so never we dies. let him in. die so that we can move <laughs> on with our lives. Nkrumah never dies in the, in the sense of, of the, the veracity of what, what he stood for. Mm. If today there's a unitary Ghana, it's because of Nkrumah. Mm. He insisted. Otherwise, it would have been fragmented. It would have been at least three different countries today. But he managed to hold us together, despite all the, the temptations, the, the provocations. People say, oh, he had to be overthrown because it was a one-party state and other. That's a lot of nonsense. Because the very, the very first attempt on Nkrumah's life was before independence, November 10th, 1956. They tried to kill him and his brother here at Accra Newtown. They bombed the house before independence. So that there had always been this grievance against him that who is this small boy who came from somewhere called Nkrofo who wants to be prime minister? And here we are, blue-blooded people from royal... Shouldn't we get over this No, and move on? There, there are lessons there because, as mm. I said, he was the only one to actually come up with a program to decolonize the economy. Till now, we haven't decolonized. This e levy thing is the worst form. In fact, the colonialists are what they call land poor. It led to... How to long will it take to decolonize the economy? Because you were an advisor to a, a government not too long ago. PNDC was in power for almost two decades. Mm -hmm. And within all that period, we've still not been able to decolonize they, the economy. They, they didn't do that because they, they, they eventually... Uh, PNDC uh, uh, phase two... Uh, at least they went through phases, two phases. The first phase was stabilizing the economy. But then after they stabilized the economy, they realized that this thing keeps recurring. So we need a long-term approach to national development. That's when they came up with NDPC and ultimately Vision 2020. But of course, because of the discontinuities in governance, we haven't really taken the time. But structural transformation will have to be a, a continuous process across governments. And this is where the issue of governance reforms also come, uh, uh, come in. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read the CRC report, the uh, Constitution Review Commission's report. I have. We need to have reforms that will encourage our political parties to work together. Mm. This whole rigid four-year system is not for us. So what will you do to celebrate in Chroma tomorrow? I will definitely, uh, in fact, I'm, I've been invited to a program tomorrow, but I have another one, but I'll definitely go and share re, with um, Comrade Kwesi Pratt. Uh, that's a, another program. Say true, Poku. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're all my brothers. Yeah. But the, the point <laughs> is that the, the validity of Nkrumah's arguments, mm. the, the fact that we owe him a lot to our nationhood today, don't forget, it, it, we always underestimate the, the enormity of the challenges he faced. He was facing the challenge of nation building, holding together different tribes that at one point some were fighting among themselves, yeah. and then promoting national development in okay. terms of meeting uh, our material needs. But lastly, mm. let me also address the issue, uh, because I, it started coming up on, on social media and other, who came up with the name Ghana and so forth and so on. Nkrumah did that in 1956. As prime minister, he wrote that in the white paper, and he did that. And when you read his biography, he actually mentions the fact that the opposition even criticized him for choosing the name Ghana. I see. Oh, yes. We'll leave, we'll leave that there. Thank you, Dr. Nimoy Thompson, <laughs> as ever. Dr. Nimoy Thompson is a, an economist. He writes a lot, very prolific writer. He is now working with the UN, advising countries on how to recover from COVID. He's given some pieces of advice to Ghana, former NDPC DG. Thank you for watching tonight's edition of the show. We'll be with you next time. The Business Dashboard is next. Bye-bye. The Point of View is brought to you by Cowbell Coffee. Cowbell Coffee. Taste it. Love it. Kel Choco Toothpaste. Kel Choco. Happy smile.